bulletin on the third page, you will see um, the search committee for the pastor and music minister position. And I think tomorrow we are coming at, or there's a group coming at 2 o'clock to pray. So anybody can feel welcome to come do that. And just a reminder that the church is open from 8 to 3, uh, closed for lunch 30 minutes at 12, anytime that anybody wants to pray. So if you would please stand. And welcome somebody. All right, and now if you will turn your attention to the baptistry. It's great to start uh, service with baptism. Uh, baptism doesn't save you. It's only representation of what Christ did for us when He died and He rose again uh, from the grave. and um, Because of that, we can live in Him. So we're excited to have one this morning. This is Emma Swallow. She came last Sunday. Emma, did you ask Jesus into your heart? Yes. Amen. So, Emma... Emma, because of your faith in Jesus, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Bear with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in the Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you so much, Father, that you're still in the business of saving lives. God, that we can come to know you as Lord and Savior. If we put our faith and our trust in you, and Father, we ask for forgiveness. And Father, we choose to live for you each day. God, I, I thank you for Emma. May we, may we uh, help her grow in you each day, Father. Um, and Father, if anyone here does not know you as Lord and Savior, may they, may they come to know you today. God, may they open their heart to you. Father, I, I thank you so much for all that you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. As we worship. Blessed be your name in the land that is planned. Abundant flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name for the sun shining down on me. The world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name 
on the road marked with suffering, pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory.
So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. Of the one who gave it all, and I'll send my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. I am His yours. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who. My soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. I am His yours. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Thank you, Sheila and team, for leading us in worship today, and thank you for being here today. Most of you know I'm Jeff Cook, and I'm better from being sick last week. 
as I left here Sunday, I thought, why did I do that? But I didn't want to leave the church hanging. But I found out during the week there were a couple of good reasons why God had me here. One, I got an email from an old friend from seminary that was bumping around online looking for church services. He's a pastor in Crum, Texas. And he said through the week he found this church and was checking out the church's website and then popped up the video of the preacher. And there I was, my old friend. And so he told me he watched the sermon from beginning to end and sent me a nice note. And, and I thanked him for making that reconnection, Tim. And then on top of that, two different pastor candidates called me this week, having heard the church was without a pastor, having looked at the website, having seen that I was preaching and tracked me down. And, you know, you can always be found and asked me about the church. And so I was glad to give a good report to a couple of prospective pastors of the church to tell them that the church is healthy and strong and functioning and well organized and doing well. Case in point, committees are working, have meetings today. Baptism is happening. Congratulations to the young lady and her family who, who was baptized today and gave her life to Jesus. And how cool it is that a congregation of people would cheer like a football game for a girl being baptized. You know, that's it's bigger deal than a football game, right? Yeah, so that's a, yeah, cheer again, you know? So, and, and more to come. Uh, college people at Passion Week and returning from that. And, and so continue to be the church and continue to function well. I've enjoyed coming to be your preacher. I won't be here the next two weeks. I have a, a couple of other assignments. One is a grandson birthday that I cannot miss. You'll understand that. He'll be five, a big five-year-old, and so we'll be there. And then the following week, I'm at a church rededication, a church that was destroyed by the hurricanes and rebuilt after uh, several efforts to get that restored. So be there. But I'll be with you a couple of weeks in February and then off and on as you continue to search for your pastor. I enjoyed coming and want to be a help to you. And the number one thing that I can encourage you to be about as you're in this transitional place is to stay united, stay connected, stay functioning as the church. It's important to remember that the leader of the church is Jesus. The pastor of the church is a facilitator of the work of the ministry of Jesus, but Jesus hasn't left. Jesus is still here. And so as you a congregation stay together, I'll be preaching some about that in a minute, stay together in the unity of the spirit of the church, follow the leadership of Jesus, and function in the role of the church and the ministry of the church, you'll be fine and God's timing will be perfect in the next season of life for your church. So let me give you that encouragement and I want to be a helper along the way. I'm also glad to have my wife, Jolynn, with me today. Uh, I am married. We've been married 35 years and she's not been unwilling to come. She's been unable to come. She's been sicker than me and so finally better. In fact, there was a period of time a couple of weeks ago when we were on each, you know, each on a couch looking at each other, wondering who was going to help the other. It was a, there was a couple of days there. But anyway, we're all better now or on the way to being better. And I'm thank you for that, thankful for that. I was going to preach this sermon last week, but it needs a little more energy than the one I did preach. So I switched. So if you would take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through through 16. And this is one of those stories, this is one of those experiences of Peter. Don't you just love Peter? I mean, he's so transparent. I think that's why we love him so much. The highs are as high as they could be with Peter and Jesus. And the lows are sinking to the deepest level lows. And then the highs again and lows again and all through the interchange of Peter and Jesus through the story of the Gospels, we see Peter just living his life transparently before us. And at the highest of highs, we relate to him. And unfortunately, we also relate to him at the lowest of lows. But he becomes an inspiration to us because Peter, in the name of Jesus, always seems to rally. He always seems to return from those mistakes, those low points. And here is a time where he is on a high point. He is in the establishment of the church under the leadership of Jesus. And he is in one of those incredible highs, one of those incredible momentum moments of the bringing forth 
the New Testament church, the church of Jesus Christ. Would you honor the Lord as we stand and read this fascinating passage together in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It says, And through the laying on of hands the apostles did many signs and wonders and were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest of them dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. Here it is. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by passing by might all fall on some of them. Let me read that again. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. God bless the reading of his word as we preach today. You may be seated. So you may have caught it or you may have missed it in that small paragraph. That even the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them and they would be made well. You have to ask the question, what's the deal about the shadow? But in order to answer that question, you have to back up and take a running start, kind of a summary of the life of Peter that got him to this moment, working in great miraculous ways for Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. You remember Peter at the beginning. Jesus came to him while he was fishing. Peter, come follow me. And Peter dropped his nets and followed Jesus. And he went on in this incredible journey with the Lord, learning how to heal, learning how to minister. There was a scene where he was commissioned by Jesus to walk on water in the middle of a storm and he kept his eyes on Jesus and he walked on water. But he began to look at his circumstances and he sank and Jesus had to pull him up and pull him into the boat. He succeeded at the highest level and then failed miserably all in the same moment. That's kind of a microcosm of the story and life of Peter. Peter moved forward and found himself on the on the a mountain with Moses and Elijah and said, we need to just build an altar and stay right here. And Jesus rebuked him for that, that it wasn't the time for that, that we need to go down from the mountain and do the work of the ministry even more. There was a time where Jesus asked Peter and the rest of the disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter stood up boldly and strongly and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, referring to himself, the rock, capital the rock. Peter's name meaning little rock. And what Jesus was saying in that moment, Peter, you're going to be instrumental in ushering in the age of the church. And you will build the church, the New Testament church, upon this rock, the cornerstone, the rock, Jesus. A high moment for Peter. And then there was the time as Jesus moved towards his crucifixion, where Jesus told Peter, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Not me, Lord. I will be with you no matter what. And as Jesus is ushered off to his mock trials and crucifixion, not once, not twice, but three times, Peter said, I do not know the man. And it says in the scripture the third time, he looked Jesus in the eye and denied him. Now, I just have to tell you, you can't get lower than that. Knowing better and denying Christ to his face. And so Jesus went to the cross and Peter went to the darkness. And Peter wasn't at the cross when Jesus died. He was in the darkness, guilty and full of sin in that moment at the crowing of the rooster. By the way, it's not a trick question. 
Do you know what the rooster, crow, you rooster did the next day after the day he crowed after Peter denied? You know what he did the next day? He crowed. And the next day, he crowed. And the next day, he crowed. R roosters crow every day. And so the association of the denial of Jesus by Peter and the crowing of the rooster rang in his ears every day. You have to wonder, how long did it take Peter to not flinch at the crowing of the rooster, knowing what he had done in the face and in the eye contact of our Lord? And so as Jesus goes to the grave, and Peter is wherever he is, when Jesus comes out of the grave, Peter's one of the first ones to run to the tomb and see that Jesus is not there and begins to testify that Jesus is risen from the grave. Peter is, sees Jesus in appearances, and so you would think at that point it's confirming to him that all of this is coming to be. But then we get to the end of the book of John, and where do we find Peter again? He's gone back to fishing. He's gone back to doing what he used to do, even through the highs and the lows and the opportunity to be restored and redeemed. He's still back to where he was. And so he fishes all night with his brothers and catches nothing. And in the morning, a man from the shore calls out and says, cast your net on the other side and you'll catch fish. Well, most practical people know that if there's no fish on this side of the little boat, there's no fish on this side of the little boat. But fishermen know that if you want to catch fish, you're desperate to do anything to catch fish. And so Peter and his guys cast on the other side, and the story is told that they pulled in more fish than they could hold in the net. And it was at that point that Peter realized there's only one person that could do that. That must be Jesus. And I love the scene of Peter throwing out his outer garments, jumping in the water and swimming to shore. And there he is, drenched, still wrangling with his guilt, still not completely whole, still ashamed before the Lord, looking a mess. And what does Peter find when he gets to Jesus? A fish on the fire. You know, there's a strong message in that right there. He's saying to Peter, Peter, I don't need a fisherman. If I command this fish to jump out of the water, build its own fire and jump on the fire and cook itself so you and I can eat it, I can do that. I don't need a fisherman. What I need originally when I called you was I need a fisher of men. Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, Lord, you know I care about you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I'm affectionate for you. Peter, do you love me? And one, two, three times Peter had denied Christ before. And one, two, three. Three times, Jesus canceled the dead by the shore. And then as we open the book of Acts, the beginning of the New, church, the New Testament church age, we find Peter and the other disciples hovering around Jesus one last time where Jesus gives them the great commission. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem where you are. In Jerusalem, the surrounding state, in Samaria, to people not like you, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And then at that point, Jesus lifted into the sky. And there's Peter and the other disciples. The angels come and say, why are you staring into the sky? He is risen. And they scurried to the upper room. They began to have a prayer meeting, and the prayer meeting probably went something like this. Oh, dear God, what are we going to do now? Because after all, they had been with Jesus, and he's now gone for good, or at least they thought. And while they were in that desperate prayer, by the way, sometimes God answers us in dramatic ways in desperate prayers, in prayers when we're bankrupt, we have no resource of our own, when there's nothing left of us. What do I do now? You know what that's called? That's called surrender. That's the most powerful place you can be. Surrendering to God, who's more powerful than anything. What do we do now? And in the middle of that passionate and desperate prayer, it says the Holy Spirit was introduced to them, not in a whisper, but in a cataclysmic, dynamic, no, dis no doubting it, kind of way. Flaming tongues of fire and noises and languages roared around the people in the upper room to the point that they could not 
contain themselves. And they came out of the upper room and with great boldness they came into the street and they began to open their mouth and the gospel message of Jesus and the words coming out of their mouth were translated to all the peoples that day. And this great cacophony of sound all centered around the gospel went in all different directions all at once. And in the middle of that noise and clatter, Peter stood up to preach. Peter that had been called. Peter that sunk in the water. Peter that denied Christ. Peter that ran away from the cross. Peter that was restored by the sea. Peter, of all people, Peter stood up to preach. And with all of that depth of testimony working with Christ behind him and the power of the Holy Spirit before him, he preached, and you can read it in Acts chapter 1 and 2, or chapter 2, and it'd take about 12 minutes to read it if you read it slowly. He preached the gospel and added 3,000 souls to the kingdom in that day. But it came out of the brokenness and out of the failings and out of the restoration of his heart. And the new church, New Testament church was added that day. They began to meet together and break bread and fellowship with one another and sell their goods and possessions and meet one another's needs. And they met every day and from house to house. And they listened to the testimony of the apostles. They didn't have the complete Bible yet. But they listened to what they had heard and what they had seen and what they knew. And it says in Acts chapter 2, The Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. And the momentum at that point was kicked into gear. And the evangelism of the gospel was going forth and going forth and going forth until we get to the passage that we just read. And it says that many signs and wonders were happening by the leadership of Peter and the rest of the apostles. And they brought the sick into the street so that even the shadow of Peter might fall on some of them and they would be made well. So I ask us again, what's the big deal about the shadow? It is, a, it is, a, is it a magic shadow that just kind of gives a healing over here and a shadow over there? Is it some sort of miraculous shadow that has some sort of power on its own that just comes over here and people are better and comes over here and people are made well? Wouldn't it be great to have a shadow like that? that just did all these great and wonderful things. What's the big deal about the shadow? I asked that question over and over again, and here's where I finally heard from the Lord. It's not about the shadow. But here's what we do know about the shadow. You've got to be there to cast a shadow. Isn't that a cool thought? I mean, unless you sit in a dark cave with no light, Everywhere you are, you cast a shadow. And so the presence of Peter and the power of the Holy Spirit with the residing presence of Jesus in his life was the healer. It wasn't the shadow. It was the presence of Peter who was willing to be there, who was willing to walk in the Spirit of the Lord and walk among people who are in need of Jesus and the power of healing and the miraculous work of the Lord that he had learned through his failings and his high points and who was given testimony of what Jesus had done for him. And it made a difference in the lives of many, many people because he was willing to cast a shadow. He was, as I coined the phrase, a shadow caster. And it's inspiring for you and me to be that same way. To realize in such a deliberate way that we are called to cast a shadow wherever we go. In fact, we cast a shadow wherever we go. It's the question of whether or not our shadow and us being present, being there, is going to make a difference in the lives of people around us. So what does it mean to be a shadow caster? What does it mean to go through this life casting a shadow for all to see? I was in Sunday school class a few months ago at our home church, and Mike Skiles was teaching the Sunday school class to about 30 middle to senior adults. And he asked the question, right down on a piece of paper and went around the room, how many children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren do you have in your family line right now? 
And there was about 30 people in the room. And we started doing the math. Grandchildren, everybody gave testimony of who their grandchildren were. It was a real warm-hearted time. And 30 people, after about five or seven minutes of calculation, ended up producing 157 people that were in their direct DNA connection. Just 30 people. This is a couple of hundred people here today. Imagine doing that in this room. We would literally have hundreds of people that are connected to us by DNA and by our family. That doesn't even count the people that we associate with, that we have close relationship in the church family and across the ages. But just think about the hundreds of people who are directly connected to you. Do you realize how important it is to cast the shadow of Jesus initially over the people that have the shared DNA of you that you are responsible for, that you, if they are your children, have brought into the world. They have married people. They have produced children. And they may even produced other children. And that you are a result, they are a result of your existing in the world. And the responsibility that you and I have to cast a shadow, particularly over those who are of our family, to pray for them, to be there for them, to show up when they're in need, to answer them when they call, to give the love of Christ to them, whether they want it or not, to live the love of Christ before them because they are your family. You extend that to your church family. You extend that to your community, to your backyard neighbor, to your side neighbor, to the person you frequent at the grocery store, to your schoolmates, to your classmates, and it becomes exponential in its influence. We have so many people to cast a shadow over in Jesus' name, just like Peter did, and make a forever difference in their lives. And so when we cast a shadow, when we wake up in the morning and say, I'm bringing my shadow with me today, where is it going to go? We can begin to see miracles take place because that's what happens with Peter. He was bringing about the miraculous. You know, some have asked me before, well, wonder why miracles don't happen as much in this country as they used to back in that day. I think part of the answer is we're not expecting them. And we've kind of explained away the miraculous by all of our modern technology and our modern ability. But these people needed a miracle and miracles still happen today. They happen in people's bodies. My wife and I sat yesterday with a longtime friend, he and his wife, who had cancer. And the doctors thankfully and prayerfully removed all the cancer, but he's in recovery. And so his body is being made well. The miraculous means of the doctors are a part of that. But I fully credit the power of the Lord working in Job to bring about the healing of body. And we pray for the miraculous healing of the body. We also can be about the activity of bringing about the healing of the mind. You know, there was a commercial way back in the day when I was a little boy. It was about a college advertisement and it said, you might remember this phrase, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. You Remember that phrase? It's so strange how this thing stick in your head. But I want to compress that phrase. The mind is a terrible thing. It can really take us in all kinds of directions, can it? It can cause us to imagine things that aren't there. It can cause us to alter relationships with people that shouldn't be altered. It can talk us into depression or anxiety or anger. It can be in all kinds of directions. The mind is a terrible thing. And if we're not careful, Satan will try to penetrate into our mind and put all kinds of thoughts there that cause us to move further and further. The mind can be well, the mind can be healed. And all of those polluted thoughts that want to run around in our mind can be put away. Just like in James where it says when we tell Satan to flee, he has to flee. In the power of Jesus, we can get control in our mind and think heavenly thoughts and think of the word. One of the best ways to heal our mind is to immerse ourselves in the word of God and take every one of the scriptures and claim it into our mind. When we cast a shadow, we see miracles of body and 
mind, and spirit. The best healing for the spirit is the Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives as believers. This young lady that was baptized came to know Jesus in her heart. And at the moment of that salvation event, the Holy Spirit moved inside of her life. It's too complex for her right now, but there is a sense of assurance that Jesus is in me and he will never leave her. And if you're born again today, Jesus will always, always be with you and be about the ministry of healing. And others need that healing too. And you and I are called to cast a shadow so that others can be made whole. When we cast a shadow, we see miracles. And also when we cast a shadow, we bring unity to the body. Look at what it says in verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That's a message to the church. Church unity is important. In fact, I can almost argue that it's more important than the message of the gospel of Jesus. I'm not, but it's really close, and here's why. If there's no unity in the body, there's no message of Jesus that's going forth. Because the world that's outside of Christ, when they come into a church that's not unified and see all the fussing and the cacophony of sound and the stirring and the murmuring, they peek in the door and say, that looks a whole lot like my house. I don't want anything to do with that. But on the other hand, if the church is united, loving one another, loving guests, loving new people, loving the community, then that becomes the power of the testimony of the gospel to go forth. As I said a moment ago, in the absence of a pastoral leader, hang in there with Jesus because Jesus is leading his church. And the number one thing he is doing is leading his message and leading the call for unity, to be there for one another, to bond with one another, to continue to be the church that the Lord wants you to be. One of the ways that we can do that is to just keep resonant in our mind our 30-second testimony. You know how simple that is? Let me give you an evangelistic teaching real quick. You have a testimony that starts with, before I knew Jesus, this is how I was. Don't spend a lot of time on that, but spend a little bit of time describing what my life was like before I met Jesus. Then I met Jesus, and the contrast on the other side is now my life is forever different than it used to be. Before I met Jesus, I was afraid that I was going to die and go to hell. As a nine-year-old boy, I found Jesus, and I've never had that fear again. What about you, friend? Have you ever had an experience like that? And there you are. You have the conversation. You have the testimony. In the grocery store line, in the bus line, or, you know, uh, getting your medicine at Walgreens, wherever you are, you have that testimony ready to go. Before I met Jesus, then I met Jesus, and now my life is this. That's how simple it is to tell people about the Lord, and any of us who know Jesus can do that. It's important to add people to the church, even in a time of transition, and build up the unity of the body of Christ. And when we do that, when we cast a shadow serving others, we gain, as they were gaining, boldness and fearlessness and respect. We create a world around us that is greatly respecting the work of Jesus and the ministry of the Jesus wherever we go. The truth of it is, it's hard to be a Christian these days. It's not as popular as it used to be, but it's just as important to live the life of Christ no matter where and wherever we are. Several years ago, I was pastor in a church in Broussard, and our youth pastor came to us and wanted to invite this worship group to come and lead the disciple now at our church. They were a little more expensive than others, but I finally relented and agreed to let this fledgling youth band come named Mercy Me. They pulled up in this old beat-up uh, Greyhound bus, and we helped them haul all their equipment into the church, and they sang their music and played, got to meet the guys, and they introduced a song that you probably heard, I Can Only Imagine, at the church in Broussard. By the fall of that year, it had become the Dove Song of the Year, and they were on with their career, and they've been blessing us ever since. 
couple of years after that disciple group came, Mercy Me came, I'd had a particularly tough day as the pastor and left the church. And as I left the church, that song came on the radio. And so I began to sing it. My heart was heavy. My heart was full. And I was singing it along. And just as I sang it, I started being there with the Lord, imagining what would it be like to be with him. And I realized the song wasn't going to be over by the time I got home. So I took the long way home so I could finish the song. And it was at its crescendo moment. Will I stand in his presence to my feet? His feet will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? And I got to a stop sign. And I'm singing with all of my heart. And at the stop sign, as I stopped there, a lady turned in the opposite direction right here. And I looked in her window, and she was singing the same song. She was, when I stand in your presence, and I thought, that's what it ought to be like in this world. That's what it should be like in our world, that we stand in his presence, before him we fall, we sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine it doesn't have to just be there. It can be right here. And just as Peter and the others had a boldness about them because of all that had happened, and we're seeing the fruit of evangelism over and over again, and we're riding the wave of gospel momentum, they were able to gain that culture of gospel share. You know, that's dependent on you and me as the church to create that environment wherever we go. Because when we do cast a shadow and when we do bring healing, it is a life changer. Can you imagine the, the crowd of people in the parade route, following Peter and the others as the shadow cast by. People laying in all manner of condition on their mats, having been brought out, couldn't move themselves. And as the shadow keeps moving, one by one, people get up, roll up their mat, and follow after Peter, who's following after Jesus. What an incredible scene that must have been as people are cheering and wailing and celebrating the healing that was coming and the following of Jesus. Today, you're going to leave here and go cast a shadow somewhere. It would be a shame to cast that shadow just for you and yourself to enjoy. The calling of the believer is to deliberately be there to cast a shadow for others. One of my preacher friends, Bubba, watched him online last week. He talked about Moses going up on the mountain to be with God, and Moses stayed on the mountain seven days before God appeared, and Bubba made this point. You know how you get to the seventh day? You be there on the sixth day, and you be there on the fifth day. Sometimes it takes some time. But it's important for us to deliberately cast a shadow and be there for those who are around us. So who are you casting a shadow for today? Who will see your shadow and see you be there? In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you put up with Peter just like you put up with us to bring us to the place of maturity and growth for the sake of your kingdom. And I thank you for those who were healed. And I thank you even today for those who are being healed, even by being in the, under the shadow of your presence. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would mobilize the church to be there even today for people who are in need. It may be a phone call or a drive-by or a cup of coffee or a letter, or an email, but whatever it might be, to be there for someone who needs you. Even this morning, as there are those here who are seeking you, that there would be those who come today and saying, I want the shadow of Jesus to fall on me. I want to be in the presence of Jesus. Move in this invitation tonight by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we sing together, would you stand and respond?